and not necessarily a scale of, you know, zero to five or whatever, but a scale on two sides, a spectrum and going proactive. I mentioned this earlier, proactive, um, meaning more of I'm prepping for something I'm about to do. And then reactive is I'm trying to reduce the negative impact of something that's already hit me in the past, whether it's day before, uh, last shift, past couple of days, whatever it might be. Welcome to RIT Team Radio, where today we're actually going to transition a little bit. We're going to change up the structure of how episodes are going to be delivered. We're going into a new format in where I uh, think segment one or uh, the first component of a theme or a concept is going to provide you with the significance or the impact uh, that whatever that theme has on the fire service. Then that next component, the second aspect is going to be, well, what research is even already out there? What do we know? And then that ties into our third piece where we're going to be integrating it into the fire service. So how does it impact fire service? What do we already know about it? And then what kind of recommendations, what suggestions, what guidelines, what different things can we uh, suggest or provide for you to be able to create actionable items. So throughout this sequence, I have Ryan Provencher with Firefighter Peak Performance uh, to be able to join us. Uh, and he's gonna be introducing the, the first off the theme, the, the concept for uh, our first series in this. And then we're just gonna kind of round table discuss um, uh, how we feel about it and how it is uh, significant to the fire service. So Ryan, welcome, uh, welcome back to the podcast. Well, hello, Hussein, and hello, everybody out there. It's great to be uh, on the podcast today. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about a, an issue concept that's near and dear to my heart, and that is mobility and flexibility training for firefighters. Oh, yeah. So with that being said, flexibility and mobility, and, and it's uh, whether it's in the fire service, which we, we hear it a lot because fitness and wellness, of course, is constantly growing the concept of taking care of yourself, longevity of health, all of this is growing and we hear flexibility and mobility, but what, is, what does that even mean? Especially if there's two different, those are two different terms, flexibility, mobility. And we usually say them together because it's easier. If we say two things that are similar in nature together, then we can't get it wrong when we define it, right? So uh, Ryan, how would you define or how would you differentiate the two? Well, and, and again, we could really do a deep dive on this and there's all sorts of information out there, but but it is important to uh, distinguish between the two and in just very general terms. And again, we're, we're talking generally here. Uh, in my mind, mobility is more related to an active range of motion. Uh, the joint is in motion and you're, you have a starting point and an end point. And then uh, for me, flexibility is a passive range of motion. So it's not a dynamic movement, you're settling into a pose uh, at a specific joint at end range. Yeah, so, and and to add to that with, with mobility is, it's what we're asking. We're asking our body to go through this movement, right? It's our desired movement pattern. So, yes. and, and how they kind of mesh together is to have mobility, you have to have flexibility. You have to have a range of motion. You have to have um, a freedom of movement at each joint or whatever joint's going to be doing that movement if you're going to ask it to go through a movement. That's where you need flexibility to be able to, to provide mobility and, and so forth. So uh, with that being said, how does that, if, if we need range of motion, if we need to be able to move, if we need quality of movement, if we need range of motion when we ask our body to move, what kind of impact does that have on the fire service? Well, it's huge in, in so many ways, and, and this ties in uh, to a lot of what we have talked about in terms of movement patterns, uh, certainly in firefighting tasks and how we tie movement patterns into exercise selection and, and all of that. So if we're talking about a specific movement pattern and we really get a little more granular in this idea, and now we're talking about extension and flexion at, at a specific joint, or we're talking about internal and external rotation at a specific joint, and we're talking about the range. And so if we're talking about a squat, for example, and we're looking at 
uh, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion at the ankle. And if someone has super stiff ankles, and I'm pointing at myself here, uh, it really impacts the squat movement pattern in a negative way. And so if we're talking about a practical application for firefighters in the area of mobility specifically, it, it's a matter of assessing mobility at different joints in these different movement patterns that are so common for us in our firefighting and in our exercise selection. And if we see any deficits, what sort of corrective exercises or planning should we incorporate into our training to address those issues specifically? Well, and to be able to do that, and and as as a firefighter, you're familiar with the movements that are asked of you, but you have to have an awareness and, and be able to say, okay, this is the task. This is what I'm doing. These are the movements. And then these are the joints that are providing that movement, which joints are the, the uh, I think, skeletal system, which is works together with the musculature to be able to create that movement. But you have to know which joints are are uh, incorporated into this, and then what is being asked of that joint. Do I need to be able to raise my arm overhead? Do I need to be able to bend forward? Do I need to be able to lift my knee? Like what is being asked of the body? And then that's when you start piecing together. Okay, I need this amount of movement to perform this task, and what is ideal? What is not? What do I need to incorporate? Do um. And we can we can know just general sense, right? Certain joints uh, have certain um, uh, think responsibilities. For instance, your hip should be mobile, your uh, lumbar should be stable, and so forth. But how much mobility uh, do you need in certain joints for certain tasks? So um, let's dive into more uh, to kind of take take a step back. Let's look at how flexibility and mobility was integrated one into your history and into your life. And then kind of how did you just your personal experience kind of mold it into your experience with the fire service? Yeah. So just in terms of my own experience, uh, I didn't know it uh, for many years until I was probably in my thirties, but I was born with hip dysplasia. And so I already had some movement limitations in my body. And, and uh, even from a young age, as a child, I was developing compensation patterns to account for this, maybe some joint dysfunction that I had. And so that coupled with putting a lot of miles on, uh, I really got heavy into uh, heavy strength training as a young teenager, uh, didn't do any stretching, didn't do any warm up, cool down stuff like that. It was more about, you know, go big or go home and and kind of the old school uh, lifting stuff back in the day. And, but as I got older, really in my early thirties, I had a lot of joint pain a lot of uh, limitations in my movement. I, I had had multiple surgeries relating to joint damage, probably as a result of these compensation patterns that I had developed. So uh, I was highly motivated in my in my 30s to, to do a lot of research and to do a deeper dive into what else was out there in terms of training modalities. And again, coming back to really two of the biggest influences on me in my own physical training and in my coaching, uh, Mark Verstegen and his uh, athletes performance programming. They, um, he got much more into regeneration and active isolated stretching and things like that. Uh, and also more intelligent uh, strength training uh, was a huge benefit to me, even in addressing my mobility issues. And then uh, Scott Sonnen really addressed me to the idea of mobility as a standalone attribute. And he had a program called Into Flow. It was really a, a head to flow joint by joint uh, from from the top down and the inside out, uh, kind of a movement flow, and I just had tremendous benefit. the The pain I was experiencing dissipated. My movement quality improved, and this light came on for me. That wait a second, this this is a whole other thing. There's there's strength over here, and there's endurance over here, and conditioning over here, but the whole idea of mobility and flexibility as standalone attributes and also standalone training methods. Uh, have been a game changer for me personally and in, in my coaching as well. Well, just saying mobility and flexibility, which we know, you know, flexibility being a component of fitness, but being an attribute to, to work on. And then actually it'd be interesting for individuals to, and we talk about a uh, more self-perceived type of uh, not necessarily labeling, but indicators of if you could say your strength on a scale of one to 10, how strong do you feel like, uh, feel that you are, uh, endurance, uh, speed and so forth. And then if you said flexibility and mobility, give me a scale of one to 10, 
everyone, you know, most people will be like, oh, I, I didn't know you're judging me on that, right? That, that just becomes a kind of a side concept. And, and it's interesting, just my experience more in uh, mainly the athletic side uh, was um, the big three or big four or so forth, right? We can extend this out if we do overhead press pull, uh, pull ups or so forth. But it was to warm up for one of the big three. Well, you use the bar and then you did you know, lighter weight, and then you slowly built up to it. And eventually, I mean, shoulder irritation, back pain, all these things catch up to you because there's, um, there, there's not always the exact right way to warm up, but there's definitely wrong ways to, to just jump into training. And so slowly incorporating movement patterns and interesting enough, just personally, I started incorporating warm ups, but the first impression of actually assessing movement for me was um, when I was working for a recreation center and we started incorporating FMS and functional movement screens and wow. assessing, okay, what does an overhead squat look like? What does a, a stationary inline uh, lunge look like? What do these different movements look like? And then how do we put a, a numerical value? How do we put some kind of uh, quantitative value to that movement, we can we can scale it, we can grade it. And it just kind of blew my mind of, okay, there's right ways to move in a in a sense. Now that doesn't mean everyone moves identical. It doesn't mean we all have the exact, exact same movement pattern, but when we can categorize movement and we can look at kind of what are uh, what are things to look for? What are indicators that, as you mentioned, dorsiflexion, plantar uh, flexion, to be able to look at ankle mobility, um, there's certain indicators that we need that we actually need to work on our mobility and our flexibility. So that was that was my initial my first impression that movement patterns exist and that we need to be assessing them. We need to be monitoring them and we need to be able to prescribe um, to to correct them. Yeah, no, and it and it to your point, it really illustrates how far we have come in the fitness industry and the wellness industry in terms of not only evaluating uh, mobility and flexibility, but also now incorporating that into our periodization and our, our uh, intentional training plans. You know, I re reflect on the early days of even fitness assessment and to, to test flexibility, we would do a sit and reach. That was the, that was the only metric that we used and, and it was a flexibility assessment and it was a sit and reach. And if you were lucky, you had a modified sit and reach that would account for, uh, you know, limb length, but but even that was was uh, not always available. So now with your F, the FMS, and I know that you you're using Dari Motion and all these advanced uh, techniques and even technology to really evaluate first of all mobility and flexibility, and then again planning and building these into your intentional training programs for your athletes. When I I remember when sit and reach was a huge like mind blowing of, oh, we're going to check hamstring flexibility and we're going to have you push this little box and uh, be able to, to, to go through this movement. We did that a couple of times for uh, within our undergrad program, we had to do different fitness assessments and um, not, not knocking the program as a whole, but just that was a groundbreaking assessment. It was something that is heavily integrated. And so there are becoming more and more advanced ways to assess movement. There's becoming more uh, awareness that there's other aspects to, to movement patterns, which is always great. Um, transitioning to strategies to attack mobility or strategies to, uh, uh, to be integrated. Now, we're not going to look at specific recommendations or uh, look at exact prescription, but what are some techniques out there that exist when say someone is asking about mobility, well, what what can I do? What are strategies to incorporate, uh, Ryan? What what is out there? Yeah, so you know, if you take a step back and you look at as an individual firefighter, uh, tactical athlete, how can you incorporate this into your own programming? Or if you're a coach that's working with tactical athletes, how can you program it into your periodized training program? So, in my experience, uh, a few ways that you can look at this three piece, three pieces to this puzzle. If you, if you know that you're doing your, you know, moderate intensity strength training or your high intensity interval training, and you, you've got uh, different movement patterns built into that, your strength and your conditioning, 
you can really use that as the core of your programming. And when it comes to mobility work, uh, one way I love to incorporate that into training is as a warm up. So you have a dynamic warm up for this specific training that you plan to do. And again, you're looking at the movement patterns in your program and your dynamic mobility session primes your body for those movements. So it's not what we used to do and use the bar uh, in the press. It's, you know, much more dynamic movement through the shoulders and the chest and the back to, to prepare that. Or if you're doing a lunge, your, your dynamic movement primes your body for the lunge pattern. Um, so that's one way. And then on, on the back side of it, if you know that you're creating tension in your body through the movement. So for example, if you're squatting and you're hinging at uh, the hip joint and you're shortening your hip flexors in that movement, then to unload that, you're really extending through the hips and you're spending some time in hip extension to, to purposefully release the tension that you've developed uh, based on a specific movement pattern. So you, you've got your very uh, specific warm up, you're going through your training and then a very comprehensive cool down to unload uh, everything that you have done in your training. So that's one, in my mind, how you can incorporate into your workout days. One, you know, you mentioned it and walked us through it, but just to really emphasize, it's it's also understanding that, and, and, you know, it depends on what your workout structure looks like and all those great things. But even if you want to say you are the master at doing the bench press, okay, you can't just stretch the front of your shoulders and, and your chest, right? It, even you mentioning that to where, okay, well, your lats are integrated. Well, you actually have leg drive and leg support, your your bicep aids in it, like your whole body actually assists with this. So there's two kind of aspects to it is it's still a full body in nature, but then also, and, and one area, one way I like uh, especially for the tactical athlete, and I recommend this to absolutely everyone, general population and all, is you're still doing a warm up. one being proactive for the training session, but you're also reactive for life. So you're still wanting to incorporate some kind of, yes, have very specific tasks that target those areas you're going to train. Hopefully you're training full body in nature. So you're going to do kind of a, a full body warm up. But even let's say you divide it upper body, lower body, you do push pull legs, whatever it might be. My recommendation is still incorporating. If you're going to do a pressing movement, if you're going to do push, if you're going to do chest, I, I'm, I mean, still look at the dynamic warm up as a holistic full set uh, approach. Yeah, you're doing that dynamic warm up. You're really priming the body. You're looking at different ways to create muscle activation uh, in support of the movement patterns that are programmed into your training. So yeah, all, all of that uh, is just a great way to really optimize your training session. And then the other thing I wanna point out too is especially around firefighters on shift work is you can use this whole idea of a, a mo mobility session, kind of a priming session as a lower intensity option on a, on a dedicated training day. So you might, uh, or same idea for your flexibility training. If you're doing, you know, yoga, for example, yoga in my mind is maybe kind of a mobility flexibility combo, but when you're in poses at the end of range of motion, it's just a really great way to release tension in your body. So let's say you're on shift, you have a busy shift, maybe you're tempted to go hard and do that high intensity interval training workout, but maybe uh, you're better off spending some time doing uh, maybe a, a dynamic movements in a priming session that next day, or maybe you really need to settle into a recovery day where you're spending, you know, 20, you know, 30, 45 minutes really in these different poses to recover and un unleash tension in your body. One, well, you just answered the question of, should you, um, only be incorporating mobility as a primer, right? Using the, the the term primer because you're trying to prep your body before you're doing some sort of activity. Um, aside from those two or aside from just warming up, should there be a warm up? Is there a concept of a cool down, a recovery day? So kind of walk through those, those different components, which you just you know, brought it up. Uh, in nature, right, is there's a warm up priming and then cool down and, and so forth. So what do uh, potentially in theory, what are they meant to do? What is a cool down? I know we usually go in and let's say 
realistically, most people skip or do a 10 second warm up. And then I don't know how many people have heard of a cool down. That might be grabbing your bag and then walking, you know, inside or grabbing your stuff or putting away the equipment. But what is, in general, like what is the uh, significance of those components? Yeah. And so, you know, you and I talk a lot about intentional training and we can put this into a, a couple of different context, right? So we talk about Recruit Academy just as an example, and I'll share with you the feedback that we get from recruits in our physical training programs year after year is for one, they just hadn't really focused on the mobility training or the flexibility training. And very quickly, because of the intensity of the occupational training, it's their absolute favorite training days. Like we do a, just a little bit of moderate, maybe touch high intensity, maybe once a week, but really the emphasis throughout Recruit Academy is this low intensity kind of dynamic dynamic movement through these mobility sessions or uh, these re dedicated recovery sessions where maybe we'll do some, call it zone two cardio, where they, they go on a light jog, but really monitoring heart rate and intensity to keep that low. And then they spend 20 to 30 minutes just stretching. And uh, we get a lot of really great feedback from recruits about those training days. And then again, coming back to firefighters and operations, you know, you want to be response ready. You want to have your peak performance days performance wise on your on shift. And then your whole physical training program is built around that to include these dynamic mobility days, uh, joint mobility work, and then uh, recovery and flexibility days as well. You know, what would be interesting is actually having Yes, you know, individuals having designated, okay, this is your warm up. All right, this is a recovery day. But just thinking of this from a and and you know, of course, all the all the thought process of of how much information we can acquire, but giving someone kind of a scale and not necessarily a scale of you know zero to five or whatever, but a scale on two sides, a spectrum, and going proactive. I mentioned this earlier, proactive. Um, meaning more of I'm prepping for something I'm about to do. And then reactive is I'm trying to reduce the negative impact of something that's already hit me in the past, whether it's day before, uh, last shift, past couple of days, whatever it might be. And in a session, giving someone a scale or a spectrum and going, where are you on this spectrum in your session? Uh, whether it's during a, even a warm up, I mentioned some warm ups, I'll have, okay, you're prepping, but I still want you doing hip mobility. Because the past couple of days you've been sitting or you've been doing this or that. So it'd be interesting just spitballing. But it'd be interesting to give someone kind of that spectrum. Just answer this every time you're warming up. Are you trying to recover from being beat up? Or are you trying to prep yourself um, for the upcoming workout? So I think yeah. that'd be interesting to incorporate. For sure. And that kind of ties into conversations we've had about intentional training metrics, for example. So we talk about a mobility rating or an intensity rating or a discomfort rating in each tra training session to include these mobility and flexibility days. And that is just a way for the athlete to um, either auto-regulate as needed or to, to, to just record where they're at on any given day. And then the other thing, when we talk about an intensity rating, for example, we really can put that into four categories, high intensity being anything above 80% or RPE of eight, you know, moderate intensity is, you know, 60 to 80% or six to eight on an RPE, low intensity is three, four, five, and then no intensity is below a two. And so if, we're talking about auto-regulation, not only within a single training session, but in terms of what we choose to do on any given day. That's what I love about having a periodized training program is these days are plugged in in a way that's intentional, but we're always giving the athlete the flexibility to make an adjustment. Hey, I was supposed to do my moderate intensity strength day today. I'm still a little beat up based on my own subjective intentional training metrics here. I'm gonna go ahead and do a mobility day. I'm gonna go ahead and do a flex flexibility day and bang, you could just sh shift these things around as needed once you learn, as you're saying, how to kind of how to kind of do some self-reflection and leave ego at the door and, and just do what your body is ready for on any given day. Yeah, and it's just gonna take one having a plan that's 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 the biggest thing is some kind of and it it doesn't have to be 
the full fetched, you know, uh, uh, a thousand tab spreadsheet type of plan, but having something, something in place where, hey, if I can go all out effort, this is this is what I would like to do. If I'm kind of beat up and I still want to work now, I still have an idea of movements and so forth. But, you know, I, I, I is kind of a moderate intensity, as you mentioned, from an intensity scale standpoint, moderate intensity. OK, this is the workout I can do. And then, hey, I'm just really beat up. Um, I, I just want to work movement patterns and so forth. This can be something just have something, have some kind of plan and start it and then start really, and you don't have to necessarily look at it from a day to day. And, and we can talk about this further in other episodes, but just document it, just write it down to yourself and yeah. then go back a month later, go back two months later and say, okay, wow, you know, this is kind of what happened with my training. Cause hopefully you're documenting lifts, weight use, how you feel afterwards. There's so much you can incorporate into that, but um, that's, that's just insight for the individual, especially for those that don't have coaches with them 24 seven or their agency. Most agencies won't have a coach that works with you 24 seven or every single time you want to work out. Yeah. And there's a lot of options out there. And uh, I think in episode three, we'll probably give folks just, just a list of resources that they could check out and see what might resonate with them. But but I agree 100%. Uh, you know, Dave Dodson, we've talked about him. He's a fire service instructor. He talks about an arbitrary approach to uh, uh, firefighting operations versus an intellectual approach. And I just believe so deeply that we apply that same idea to fitness. You know, we, we don't want to be arbitrary in how we approach our physical fitness or wellness. We want to be very intentional about it. And if we've got a plan in place that provides the structure we need, but then we also have enough knowledge to be flexible in adjusting that based on uh, how our body feels from day to day. Uh, now, now you're talking about uh, not only having a solid baseline for your fitness, but being able to monitor your progress over time. Well, I already just this be <laughs> this being the first episode in the series, I already like the structure, hopefully, um, and we're about to end it here. But Hopefully you like this structure where we're introducing the concept and the next episode, we're going to get into the research. We're going to get into what does literature say? What's already out there? What do we know? And then episode three, how can we make those recommendations for it? How can we create actual items where you listen, you listen, you hear a plan, and then you can incorporate that plan. So tune in next time. We'll be looking at episode two of this series looking at flexibility and mobility.